Hello, my name is Greg Cox, as you can well see. Uh, I am with a company called the Bissell Companies in Charlotte. Uh, anybody here from Charlotte? Uh, we're a development company. If you've ever heard of something called Ballantyne Corporate Park, uh, South Park. We do office development and other types of development in that area. I, excuse me, I am, a, I have for the last 33 years, I'm 127 years old, have been a land broker. Uh, I am what is sometimes talk, called a site selection specialist, and uh, so I'm going to go really fast because I got 33 years to talk about. Uh, so um, the title, of course, using GIS to support land development decisions, uh, also to identify, rank, negotiate, entitle, and inquire, acquire land. Uh, this is usually for big projects, everything from hospitals to shopping centers to uh, some of the largest um, mixed-use centers in this state, that sort of thing. So, and I've got a did. Nothing's happening. Is that that software not letting it? Slides transition. There it goes. All right. Uh, so, just to start with, tools of the trade. This is what I like to call my specialized land acquisition vehicle, and the way I have got this set up is that computer is actually this computer. There's a two terabyte hard drive that has all the GIS data for every state, state, local agency, state, federal, bunch of private vendor stuff on the hard drive. Uh, and in addition, to, you know, with a with a hot spot, you can you can pull in imagery and that kind of thing. But but it's important because you're out in the field a lot. You're doing land acquisition. Um, uh, just another view of it. Up there is a touch screen in the back, so people in the back can play, and they can also hold up, you know, a thing like this. So uh, when we're out really reviewing sites, um, I'm not always driving. I'm usually operating the the the, the, uh, the gadgetry. So uh, get some bug some metaphors and buzzwords. Site selection specialist is you know kind of a big name. Uh, people in the industry don't really use that. You're a land act person for land acquisition, so I'm a land act guy. A metaphor. If you're a land act guy and you're a specialized acquisition vehicle, what would it feel like to be that? Some days it's beautiful sunny days. Some, whoop, some days not so much. Some days it feels kind of luxurious. Some days it's just, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, so, the topic of this is obviously using GIS in this profession. So I'm going to tell you a little bit how the profession works. How to become a Land Act guy in five easy steps. You first meet with the, with the end user, whether it's a hospital or a school or a developer of a thousand lots or a shopping center developer or an office park developer, and you define your hypothetically perfect site, which doesn't exist. And then it becomes a sorting and matching uh, sort of a thing. So um, at the bottom bullet point's important. I do this every day. Usually people who build these facilities do them periodically. There may be two, three, five years between acquiring sites. So it's my job to pull a lot of detailed information out of them that they know but wouldn't think to, to give to me. That's what that interview is very critical. Uh, now, you've got some basic information, you start your mapping work. Uh, so the mapping work is, I'm going to oversimplify. We need 100 acres somewhere over in South Charlotte, uh, and it needs to be either zoned or rezonable for a mixed-use product. So, and all these maps are from real projects, so you're going to be some, see some redaction and that kind of thing for, for, for privacy. So initial outward, real life, real life examples. Uh, this is one way. Uh, totally different kind of a um, mission. This was uh, a, an entity that needed multiple locations, so we did 30 sites to look at, and you add some relevant layers, and now you start zooming into the individual sites, you see that I'm redacting things for privacy. Uh, and so all 30 sites, I'm not going to bore you with all 30 sites. On a different mission, similar situation, 
this is a more of an urban search. Uh, uh, Y'all, excuse me, I have a cold and I uh, took a bunch of decongestants, so dry me out. Uh, so um, you tailor it to that. Things that are going on, why is it, uh, what's the development around it, uh, et cetera. So you now have, you're back into another meeting, and now that you've set those expectations, you go, okay, here's the entire inventory of all the sites that could possibly work. There might be 10, there might be five, there might be seven, whatever it is. It's the entire universe of all sites that make any sense of all. And most of them are going to be assemblages. Um, so you review and discuss the sites in the overview maps that we just put together. You pull up a spreadsheet that all the criteria that we've already agreed upon that are that's important to you. Uh, and uh, you need to do two things. You need to agree how important each criteria is because, for example, location may be more important than land price. Usually it's a lot more important. So you have, a, you have an important score times the absolute score. And you're at very early stages. So this is a super simplified spreadsheet. They're always a lot more complicated than this. But you just, we're doing just, you know, some, some, some basic types of uh, um, scoring on a scale of one to 10. We're not in the weeds yet. We're just trying to get a feel for these sites and trying to quantify which ones we may want to go after. So how this math works is you, you on the top layer up there, the red numbers, uh, you value how important each of these things are. This is just made up example. Uh, and then down, down the layer, each individual site, uh, you give it a score. So the importance times the score takes all the way, you get a total number of points, and then you get a ranking. And then not just one through nine, but in this case, but exactly how much percentage difference there is. A lot of times that math brings out uh, things that, you, that are completely non-intuitive. Later on, you use the same format, but then as, as information gets to be better known, the spreadsheet gets, gets much bigger, and the numbers are real, and it just continues on, but now they're used to using this, this, this scoring method. So, uh, now you've, you've, you've scored your sites, and you're gonna go after them in rank order. Um, doing this for 33 years so far, uh, I'd say between 85 to 90 percent of all sites I've ever bought were not for sale. You don't base, that's not even a criteria. Uh, it might be for sale, it might not, you're lucky if it is, maybe you're not. Uh, the criterion, uh, the criteria that you look for are the best match for this particular project. So. You contact the site owners, they're gonna tell you that for the umpteen million time from their perspective, no, we don't wanna sell, we're not interested. So you present, so here comes the part where you get into the mind of the seller. You use business cases to say why it's an opportunity for them. That means education with strong, actionable information. And here's the value. Uh, you take them into, uh, th this is a case study. Let's say, for example, that we're trying to uh, persuade a landowner of a major high value site that we'd like to do a mixed use project that's gonna be in the several hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars in total build out costs. And he's going to naturally say, well, the Chick-fil-A on the corner paid $2 million for, for an acre and a half, so that's what I want. I want, I want you know, roughly $2 million an acre. He needs some education. So this is a real, uh, uh, project in, in, uh, in um, Mecklenburg County. Uh, this is the life cycle of that project. And, and these are in time order. You start out in, in, in 2014 when they got the rezoning. You, you, the deed when they bought the, the rough first piece of property ungraded. And then all the way down through and how they get down to where they're selling sites for a million dollars an acre. So the landowner gets an education about how that works. Uh, it's, it's powerful. And if he doesn't like that one, there's one right across the street. Uh, this was happen the first one happened to be called Waverly, the next one's Ray Farms. Same deal. Uh, uh, you dispel the myths and you replace it with education so that good business decisions could be made. Um, 
Another example. This is more of a rural area that happens to be Valentine over there in kind of the top left area. This is an example of uh, a whole bunch of rezonings and sales that have happened over the last five years. Uh, land in this area has literally doubled in four years, the price of land. So here you have to, you've got uh, a landowner who's seeing a doubling in four years and he's, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna hold. So you, you really need tools to say, don't let yourself hit 2007 again because we were having all these doublings and then all of a sudden the market went dead. And you're also having to uh, show in a very real way how and why these prices have gotten so out of hand because your client is going to need to spend, he may be budgeted $10 million, he needs to bring $20 million. Um, that transaction actually closed two weeks ago. All right, so, um, no, I just went backwards. Another example, this is a more urban. The point is facts, facts, facts. That's how you, you change minds and you treat people as if they, with the, with the respect that they deserve. Okay, now we've, landed, we've educated them about, their, um, about the market. So what about our property? This is just a random example I pulled. So let's do some analysis of the property. This is kind of quickly, here's something that's going on next door. Uh, we're targeting this site over here in the yellow. Uh, let's talk about things that have happened um, in your market, uh, what some probabilities are. Here's a, here's a next door thing. Uh, so quickly, we've educated the owners and about the market and about what the possibilities are for their property because you always have some kind of physical constraint, an entitlement constraint, environmental constraint, all that. So there are many more layers that we don't have time to, to go over, but that gives you a gist of it. That, uh, so now, landowner says, yes, I love you. Purchase contract negotiated, serious due diligence begins. I just flew past the hardest part of this job is getting that purchase contract negotiated. Uh, you know, there are big dollars at stake, and the long knives are out, and everybody's playing for keeps. So just, just know that we just blew past the most important part. Uh, so due diligence, what does that look like? It could be a lot of different things. Um, these hyperlinks all go to different places. Uh, as I scroll through this, probably won't even need to scroll through the whole thing because there's going to be a whole lot of stuff, but just as a, as a general idea, uh, you write these due, these due diligence things like a newspaper article. You start with the general and you go to the specific. The beginning is a quick overview that the head guys in the headquarters in New York City are going to read the first five pages and go, looks good to me, now we push it down to the, to the financial guys and the engineer people and pardon my ladies and guys. Uh, so you're going to see that we're going to go from the general to more specific. This is general, this is just location, what's going on, things around it, why is it uh, an opportunity that might be worth looking at. Um, here are just some little map trickery where you grab a screenshot from showing all the retail and then you can, you can click on that and it'll take you right into just any any person who's not a computer person, you click on that and it'll take you right into that environment with all those things and then you can browse around yourself. Uh, so, uh, more of the same. Um, uh, one thing that I just really don't understand why people still do this day and time in my profession, just about all marketing package you ever see of all of my competitors have these uh, silly three, six, and nine mile radii. We don't fly like birds, we drive in cars. Drive times matter. Uh, silly radii are dumb. Uh, so you'll never see a radius on my map unless it's making some different point. Uh, so. And then you can get, uh, this is just information about, now again, we're still speaking to the executives. We're, we're kind of selling. Uh, we'll get to the technical stuff in a minute. But even if you wanna get, you know, tricky stuff, if, you, you know, if he's never been here, he can see that video. I'm gonna keep going. All right, so uh, same thing here, video going a different direction. The little graphic there shows where the video goes to. Uh, all right. Zoom out. These are some physical characteristics of the property, kind of overall. 
and adjoining properties. So this is speaking to whether or not maybe we could do an assemblage of some other stuff if we want to upscale the thing. And then just plan some little map trickery. If uh, there are a lot of people, believe it or not, you guys are professionals. You're used to reading topography maps. Some people can't see them, so it helps to color code the uh, with the digital ele elevation models. Uh, where am I? So now we're kind of focusing in on the property, and we're getting a little bit more technical. Not much yet, but getting there. Uh, and these are just soil types that are on that piece of property. Um, and now we're, you know, here's some. Here's some site plan overlays, that ways that it could be developed that, that are as is, where zone, as zoned currently. Uh, and then um, it, sometimes uh, on high target properties, uh, there have been other people who've done other studies. And, and if you're the landowner and you know what you're doing, you negotiate to get copies of those studies. So uh, uh, we're not there yet. This is just speaking to school zones. This happens to be a study for for a piece of property that would have been a high-end residential development. Uh, uh, and then now we're talking about zoning and entitlements, what's possible. Uh, all these are, I'm blowing past a lot of, but this, these are actually hyperlinks to the portion of the ordinance that speaks to exactly what this is. So it's just, it's just a ready, easy for somebody to pull in and go do all that. Uh, and then a, you know, a map showing that, uh, of this piece in red, part of it's in one jurisdiction, parts in another, which is, which presents its own kind of challenges, uh, and so that speaks to the part that's in there. Uh, and then if you go ahead and a lot of gobbledygook that only uh, development people care about, uh, another type of site plan that could be done, and another type, and another type, and these are existing examples of nearby within a certain drive time uh, of existing developments that have already been that you can get in your car and drive on. These pictures are a little old now. They're all built out now. Uh, and some more. Okay, so now we're getting into utilities. Um, what else? Um, you know, just graphics of exactly where the actual manholes are on the utility lines and all that for obvious reason. Uh, same thing. A little overview of the basin and what it's going to take to get there because there will be a pump station. There's all kinds of different... Uh, um, these are calculations as to what the pump station will cost. There's a $700,000 cost. That's just a fee to build the pump station, and the pump station itself costs a couple of million dollars. So these are not small dollars. Um, and that's an overview of how you use some GIS stuff. How much time I got left? Uh, and so now let's look in the in the back room if this thing will let me do this. Um, so, a couple things. Um, this is ArcMap. This is where I build most of the things. Uh, I guess everybody in here probably uses ArcMap. Familiar with? Okay. So, you're going to see that on all of my projects, I've got literally hundreds of layers to play with. Uh, here's an interesting example. I'm not going to go turn all these on because it just will eat up time. What's showing right now is um, just happens to be the colors and diameters of these circles. These are all of the actively selling subdivisions in the entire Charlotte region. If I zoom out, this is everything within 18 counties. Uh, but I won't take, take the time to do that. Uh, so the colors mean one thing, absorption rates, uh, uh, this, the, the uh, diameters mean another thing. The number of units, uh, there are two diameters, number of units that total build out and number of units currently on market and that kind of thing. Uh, an another interesting thing, at least to geeks like me, is, for example, on all of my projects, uh, you've got uh, all the parcels from year 2000 to 2018. I need to add 2019 now because I've got those. Uh, and all the aerials from 1999 on forward. Why is that important? When you're talking with landowners and or the developers, you can visually show almost kind of a time-lapse photography kind of situation where here comes the growth wave. Why did it stop at this road? Or why did it stop at this top of this basin? Well, it stopped there because there's no sewer. It stopped there because you just hit a municipality that's not friendly to development. And um, there's, there's just, if, if there were a better way to help get into the minds 
of decision makers, both landowners and land buyers. If there were a better way, I would throw this away and go get that better way. I haven't, I haven't discovered a better way yet. Uh, there's a augmented way. So um, build a bunch of layers inside of uh, ArcGIS. Let me get this thing up here. Um, so now we're just over in Google Earth. Everybody can Google Earth. Google Earth. So uh, a lot of times for, for the end users, if, if you're doing a site search for somebody, um, um, you can send them a KML file. I guess we all know what that is. You can export shape files into KML files, which, which is keyhole markup language for, for, for people who care, uh, which is the language of Google Earth. So they can just click on that. It's usually a fairly small file. And um, here's what one looks like. So, for example, um, this is candidate sites for, for Project Relivable. Another kind of cool trick is that, you know, we all have know what Google Street Maps are, but you can also go out if you set your settings right in your phone so that you georeference all your all your all your uh, all your pictures. Uh, you can go up and take up to the minute latest pictures of everything that you're looking at so that you can make points about competition and opportunities and all that kind of stuff. So um, I have no idea where we're on time. Okay. So told you I was going to go fast. This is just a mashup. Um, congratulations, you've seen about a half of 1% of what, what we do. Oh, and I, I would like to finish with um, I left at 28 years old as a farm boy with zero dollars, didn't know a single soul in Charlotte, grew up in Southern Union County, uh, decided I wanted to become a land broker. About five years after that, GIS happened. I bought a, I bought a computer, bought the software. I've never taken a single course in any of this. Had this whole ecosystem not come into being, there's only a certain amount of deal flow that you can do because hand making maps like we started with light tables back in the day to do this kind of analysis was super time intensive. So it's because of all people like you, I'm so grateful that I've had the career that I've had. And I cannot over express the importance of that. And that's why at this gray hair stage of my life, it's very important to me to try to give back to this community. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. What's your data management strategy for your projects? Do you identify them by project or is it just a constant? I have I have one uh, project file that's updated constantly that has everything in it. I've got a fast version and a slow version. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, for obvious reasons and uh, and I also have to buy the biggest, baddest computer that you can possibly buy on Earth about every 12 months because it's, it's doing stuff it's not really meant to do on it. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a really time consuming thing. And uh, I am constantly upgrading. These days it's much easier. Most counties have download sites so that you can pull in the latest and all that kind of stuff. But, but uh, uh, that's a job in itself. It's good to not be a big sleeper. Yes? Who deals with the political element of these acquisitions? So the accounts and the way it depends on the community and so that huge problem. That would be me. So what 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 I am, and I'm actually kind of an unusual animal in this field. Uh, almost all of my competitors, remember I'm a farm boy that came from nothing and had nothing and knew nobody. Uh, I'm in a business where um, it's a very privileged business, there's a lot of money in it, and most people do relationship-based things, and they go hire engineers to do this stuff. Um, and I passed all of them about 20 years ago in terms of deal flow and how it works and all that stuff, because you can only do so many deals on a golf course. You, you've got to make help people make good business decisions about big dollars. So. You could think of me as a traffic cop. There's an engineer in the room, there's an attorney in the room, there's a financial guy in the room, there's the guy who writes the checks, and the engineer will say something, 
Yes. And the attorney and the financial guy will say, what did he just say? And I'll translate to them and show them on a map what that means. And the attorney will say, well, the legal ramifications are such and such. And then the, 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 and the, and the uh, engineer will go, what does that mean? And that's where I, I am. So, so I'm in the middle of all that. So you, you kind of have to be, it's a multi, multiple disciplinary generalist kind of thing. But, thank you. Uh, yes? I guess the, the, the uh, no, I don't need that. Is. All the above. Uh, I, I, I am a major data ham, uh, and I really like matching up, mashing up different combinations of data to see patterns before other people see it. It's always about getting there first, and uh, so, yeah. Um, Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. I can introduce myself.